Amen. All right. This is, we're, we're, we're in a series, a really long one called Family Values. Let's, let's, let's not say that. A really good one. Yes. Like, it doesn't have to be long. To, we're, we're Christians for eternity. So what's long when you are uh, walking in eternity? We're in a great series, a good series called Family Values. And if you are new watching online, uh, we have six family values. Um, You'll be hearing about uh, more of them over the next several weeks. We already did We Give Together, so go back and check out those two messages. We did We Eat Together twice. Go back and check out those two messages. And this is my third week on We Worship Together. Originally, when I went to preach this message, I felt that we would have two weeks of each one, but the Lord stopped me and said, we're going to do about eight weeks maybe more, on we worship together. Because if you don't get worship right, you get nothing else right with your relationship with God. And so we are just going to spend as much time as the Lord wants us to on worship. But not just in general, like what the Bible says about worship, but specifically through a the study of a place in the Old Testament called the Tent of Meeting or the Tabernacle. This was the temporary place that hosted God's presence until the permanent place of the temple would be built. Now, some of you may not know this, but to this day, there is no temple ordained by God for people to go and worship. Scripturally, we come together in unity to be the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so in order to know what it really means to be a Christian, you really have to understand some Old Testament theology or facts about what happened. And it all points to Christ. One of the things that I think we are, um, we are mistaken is we go, the New Testament points to Jesus, the Old Testament points to the rules. No, it all points to, to Jesus. And it is in maturity that you can find Jesus and love through a rule, a law, or a regulation. Think about immature children who um, cannot see love through rules. Nobody, you're not having pizza five nights in a row. An immature kid, literally that makes them feel unloved. So when we only view God's love as is there's no rules, that is my biggest sign that a Christian needs to grow in immaturity is that they deem any rules any regulation, anything that's different than what I want to do or who I want to be is a, def- is a profound act of hate. I'm going to say that again. Anything that's different than what I want to do is a profound act of hate. It's hate speech. That Kids feel hated when they don't get the cookie for breakfast. You hate me. You hate me. But no, no, no. Some of the greatest acts of love are found in rules, laws, and regulations. And how many of us know that when we get older, there are those things that, kid, that we hated when we were kids, and we do the same stuff to our kids. We hated it when we were five, and we make our five-year-olds do the exact same thing that we hated because we have learned through maturity that a rule that we hated was an act of love, not an act of bondage. And so this is why we're taking a look at some rules, and my hope is that not that you find another rule to follow, but that you find the love of God in some of the strictest rules he created. And so we were going through the eight pieces of the furniture in the tabernacle. And the first week we talked about uh, that beautiful scripture in Psalms 103, where it says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. The gate would represent um, the entry, obviously, into the tabernacle. There was one way in and one way out, and that was the gate. If you weren't watching last week, please catch up on all the old sermons we mentioned in John chapter 10, verse 9, I believe, where Jesus said he is the gate, and we enter into situations through our relationship with Jesus, and we even exit out of situations through our relationship with Jesus. And now we are on our second week in a row on the courtyard. Last week, I talked about the sacrifice that takes place on this piece of furniture called the brazen altar. We can put the brazen altar on the screen, the brazen altar. So uh, Israel would enter into the gate that represents Christ, and immediately they would come into the brazen altar. If I could give you a metaphor, a New Testament metaphor of what the brazen altar is, the brazen altar technically could be like what the cross is in the New Testament. It is where the animal went to die to remove the sins from the people. The animal became the sin so that people could uh, have their sins removed. So you could technically say that the brazen altar would represent what happened on the cross. Uh, Jesus' blood was spilt on the cross. The animal's blood was spilt on the brazen altar. 
And last week we talked about that the, the community would bring their own sacrifice to the brazen altar and that the true provision of God in Genesis chapter 22, which is Abraham walking his son up uh, to, to sacrifice to the Lord and, and the son uh, didn't end up having to be sacrificed because the Lord provided a sacrifice. So true provision is not God giving you what you want. True biblical provision is God giving you something to keep and something to sacrifice. And as you have discernment on which one of those things, you are walking in maturity as a Christian. And so that's kind of like the, the, the briefing, uh, if you will, on what has happened. Now, I'm supposed to today move into what would be the brass lever. Somebody put the brass lever in the chat. That's L-E-V-E-R, where the priests would wash their hands representing a cleansing. Um, but I feel like we need to stay on the brazen altar uh, one more week. I, I, I feel this so strong. First of all, last week, I apologize. I didn't bring up the brazen altar enough. But anytime you're talking about the sacrifice that happened on the brazen altar, Altar. So this is week two. Uh, that little recap, I hope it blessed you. If you didn't watch those other sermons, still watch them anyway. Don't, don't go, nice recap. I, I'm cool. I'm not going to watch it. Nope. Let's just watch them anyway. Um, Leviticus chapter eight. I almost brought in the voice, but I was like, I'm waiting. The, the Kermit voice, but not. <laughs> Lord said not yet. Uh, Leviticus six. What, what, what voice is he talking about? What, what does he mean? Uh, Leviticus 6, chapter 8, uh, Leviticus 6, verses 8 through 13. Two weeks in a row in Leviticus. How cool is this? Keep in mind, last week we talked about the rules for the sacrifice. So listen to this. The Lord said to Moses, give Aaron and his sons the following instructions regarding the burnt offering. The burnt offering must be left on top of the altar until the next morning. And the fire on the altar must be kept burning all night. So now last week we talked about there's rules for the offering, but I didn't want to move on to the next piece of furniture in the tabernacle until we understood that there was also rules for the fire. Someone say rules for the fire in the chat. Or you can say it out loud if you're in here and on the chat if you're not in here. The burnt offering must be left on top of the altar and the fire on the altar must be kept burning all night. In the morning, after the priest on duty has put on his official linen clothing and linen undergarments. I want to stop here for a second because why did the priest have to change clothes? He had, whenever he was doing ministry duties, he was doing them in linen, in linen. This is important for you to understand for anyone who is uh, called to vocational ministry, which to be careful, um, everyone's called to ministry. Certain people are called to be compensated for ministry. And if you're called to be compensated for ministry, the standards are higher than those who are uncompensated. That is a fact. Levites were allowed to, to, to be provided from the offering, and the Levites had the strictest rules of anyone in Israel. So I understand grace for leadership, but the Bible says not everyone should teach because much more is required. To whom much is given, much is required. So there were some requirements that these priests had to meet. Now, this is unbelievable. One of the requirements, and I don't have time to read it, was in Ezekiel 44. They, it says that the Levitical priests, as they're serving the Lord, are not allowed to perspire in the Lord's presence. They are not allowed to sweat. So one of the reasons why they were wearing linen garments, y'all, is that the Lord had made it illegal to sweat in his presence. Now, the brazen altar, y'all, was not in Malibu at 1 p.m. on a Sunday afternoon with the breeze blowing, making it a cool 71 degrees. The, 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 the wind swept landscape, just beautiful. And you could just move around slow and perfect. Anybody like when you raise your hand, you got the little mark under your armpit. That, that's not, that don't happen in Malibu. Malibu is where you go to be chill. It's always cold. You got to bring a jacket in July when you visit Malibu. No, no, no. They were in the Middle East. Why would God make a rule that you can't sweat and then put you in a situation that promotes sweat? I 
feel like preaching. It just came out. I'm going to throw my binder. I said the Lord put the priest in a situation that promoted sweat and then told them you're not allowed to. What if God wants to take his nation of priests, which the Bible calls you and I, and says, I'm going to make it illegal for you to worry in this season, but then I'm going to put you in a situation where everybody worries. I'm going to make it illegal for you to have fear and then put you in a situation where everyone's afraid. I'm going to make it illegal for you to have hopelessness and then put you in a situation where everyone is hopeless. I'm going to put you in a situation where no one gives and then I'm going to ask you to give. He literally put them in a situation that it was nearly impossible not to sweat and asked them not to. And so what happens is the priests had to move slow. We hate slow. We hate slow. That means they had to move methodical. You ever seen church ministers and pastors and people who say they're called to ministry moving slow? No, in a lot of church environments and conferences, people are running around like chickens with their head cut off. Just, oh, we got to do this. We got to do this. Oh, we got to do more, 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 more. I'm not doing enough. I'm not doing enough. And a priest in the Bible was walking around with a linen garment, checking for sweat not for something to make them feel like they were really doing a good job. And God accepted this. And one of the reasons why I feel that prevented them from from sweating is that they weren't doing it for anyone. There wasn't anyone watching. Priests did most of their job with no one watching. If you're going to do something for God where everyone is watching, he'll make you have the same passion when no one is watching. No one knows what we do. I know. Because everybody's getting ready to know what you do. This is great preaching. Did you hear what I just said? No one knows what we do, and I feel so unseen. We we post on Instagram, I feel seen. If you feel seen, if you want to feel seen, you're getting ready to miss out on what God has for you. Because God will make sure of it that you feel unseen, especially if you're called to be seen. You'll go through a season where no one sees what you're doing. And so these priests, not sweating, uh, they're told in verse 11 that they must take off these garments, change back into their regular clothes, and carry the ashes outside the camp to a place that is ceremonially clean. Meanwhile, the fire on the altar, more rules about the fire, must be kept burning. It must never go out. Each morning, the priests will add fresh wood to the fire and arrange the burnt offering on it. He will then burn burn the fat of the peace offerings on it. Verse 13, remember yet again, the fire must be kept burning on the altar at all times. It must never go out. Does it say it can go out sometimes? Did it say it can go out if you had a long day? Does it say it can go out if somebody made you upset, if it it frustrated you? Did it say it could go out because there's too many uh, Christian leaders falling? And so let me step back. No, no, no. It must never go out. The fire on the brazen altar must never go out. One of the uh, metaphorical meanings of fire prior to the 12th century, which many of these people would have understood, we kind of lose passion. Fire just kind of means fire, or it means like you're, something's cool. Like, man, that's fire. But back then, it meant uh, burning passion. And in some cultures, the liveliness of the imagination. How cool is that? The liveliness of the imagination. God is always trying, as Ephesians 3.20 tells us, to do more than we can ask, imagine, or think. So if the enemy knows that God wants to do more than than, than you can ask, imagine, or think, then he will want to dampen your fire, to dampen your imagination, your faith to ask God for things, and destroy your thought processes because God wants to do more than you can ask, imagine, or think. Fire in the Bible always communicated something. And at its core, it communicated the very presence of God. Many biblical instances, fire was a manifestation of God himself. When Moses originally got the 12 commandments, the Bible says the mountain of God was on fire. And they were afraid to approach it 
because fire also meant judgment. Have you ever heard when you try to say anything biblical to people that has any rules or regulations to it at all, they say, well, that's not what Jesus would do. That's not what my Jesus would, my Jesus would never. You can be whatever you, you can do whatever you want to do. That's not what Jesus would do. And what they're doing is they're saying that's not what Jesus did when he was here, which is true. But I want you to write this down. As Christians mature, another sign that of immaturity in your faith is when you're always talking about what Jesus did when he was here. But as Christians mature, they become more concerned about Christ's return than his first time here on earth. I'm going to say that again. As Christians mature, they become more concerned about Christ's return than his first time here on earth. One Bible scholar said, the reason why the disciples were willing to do anything that day to preach the gospel, even if it meant death, is that most of them genuinely believed today was their last day before Christ's return. They lived like Christ was coming back tonight. If you knew what Christ was coming, if Christ was coming back tonight, what would you do? Maturity in Christianity is doing that. If you would spend time with your kids, if you would do whatever you would do, if you would repent, we would be doing all kinds of stuff if we knew Christ was coming back tonight. And maturity is being able to leverage your time with eternity and Christ's return in your heart. Immaturity is, well, when God was here, he kept loving people. Why is this important? Because we're talking about the fire on the brazen, brazen altar. And a lot of people don't understand what's going to happen when Christ returns. Second Thessalonians verse 1 through 7 uh, says that uh, God wants to give um, relief to, to you who are troubled and to us as well. And this will happen when the Lord Re Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire. So that means that when Christ comes back, he's coming back with the fire of judgment. The reality is he was here with compassion and love and grace but the gap in between Christ's resurrection and ascension to heaven is not to remind people how Christ walked around petting, petting lambs and hanging out with people. It's to remind people he's coming back and to prepare people for his return because it was a love fest when he was here. It's judgment day when he comes back. And if you are so focused on his love that you are not reminded that he's coming back with fire... If you are so focused that he came with love that you forget he's coming back with fire, then love will make you do some really silly things. Think about what the silly things we can do when we love our kids. We can love our kids so much that we don't discipline them. We can love our kids so much that they yell at us and they scream at us. We can love our kids so much that we let them do things that they shouldn't do because we're more concerned with making them feel loved than the actual profound fact that since God is love, then his truth must be an act of love as well. And so what does that mean for us if you're watching for the first time? It's like, yo, Christ is coming back. It, I'm just saying, don't, you, you, you know, you, we all had those parents, man. You had that, you, there's certain family members, certain people had that, dad, you didn't play with mama. You didn't, we, mama don't play. Mama will love you, but don't, we don't disrespect, we don't disrespect our family. We, I, I, there was a reverence there that children had for their father. So I feel sometimes if we're not careful, what the fire of God and the brazen altar represents is that God himself is a fire. God himself is an all-consuming fire. And we need to be careful that in order to feel loved or to love people, that we don't do our job to prepare him them for the second coming, which says Christ is coming, not as a baby, but as a blazing fire. And we think he's coming back as a baby. This is why on, on Christmas, we sing, Away in the manger, no crib for a bed. The little boy Jesus laid down his sweet head. We sing those songs and people rock back and forth. But there's really no worship song. He's coming back with the fire of judgment. <laughs> And every sin that you make will be accounted for. We don't sing that. But it's true. But that's not encouraging. 
So let's remove all the things out of the word of God and all the things that are in Christ's nature that don't feel nice, warm, and fuzzy. And we, we miss out on this fire that I believe that the brazen altar represents, which is the presence of God. Glory is also associated with the fire in the Bible. Exodus 24, verse 17 says to the Israelites at the foot of the mountain, the glory of the Lord appeared at the summit like a consuming fire. So this is the part where the glory represents, sometimes it's hard to distinguish the glory of God between the presence of God, but one of the best interpretations for the glory of God is when Moses said God to God in Exodus 33, God, show me your glory. And the Bible said this, uh, that, that God said to Moses, yes, I'll show you my glory. I will let all my goodness pass before you. And then the Bible says that Moses had to hide from God because all of God's goodness would kill Moses because Moses wasn't holy enough. So what does the fire of God also do? It purifies us of our sin. Remember this, the sacrifice was burned in the fire. So when the priest laid hands on the sacrifice, transferring the sin of the people to the sacrifice and the righteousness of the sacrifice to the people, then the sacrifice was put on the altar and burned by fire, representing the burning of sin. Why is this important? Because when the glory of the Lord, the full goodness of God, what the fire of God burns up in you that isn't supposed to be there prepares you for the goodness of God. Can I say that? The fire of God, which is purification, prepares you for the goodness of God. If God were to let all of his goodness pass before you in your finances, all of his goodness pass before you in blessing, all of his goodness pass before you, it would take you out. Anybody know out there that blessings are are heavy? Sometimes blessings are, you know, carrying blessings or managing blessings are harder than waiting for them. For the real people who are walking in blessing, I thought it was hard when I was waiting for blessing. Oh my God, it's nothing compared. That's why the Bible says these light and momentary troubles are nothing compared to the glory that will be revealed later. Light and momentary trials. What is you? you, That's why it's so important to read your word, y'all, because it calls in First Peter these trials fiery trials. It is fire that prepares you. For glory. Another thing we should know about the fire is Christians are supposed to be baptized in the fire of God. Anybody want to be baptized in the fire? We love water baptism. We don't want the fire. And back to what people say about Jesus. You know, we should just be more like Jesus. Jesus just loved people. Jesus didn't bring this up. Jesus didn't bring that up. He just walked around and loved people. John the Baptist said this about Jesus. I baptize with water those who repent of their sins and turn to God. But someone is coming soon, he's talking about Jesus, who is greater than I am. And he could bring up a lot of attributes about Jesus. He could bring up that Jesus was loving, that he just walked around and loved people, that Jesus was Jesus was all those things. Someone's coming greater than me. Wait till you see the miracles. Wait till you see the awesome. Wait till you see the provision. Wait till you see the love. Wait till you see the way he treats people. He could have brought all that up to suggest that Jesus was greater than him. But he brought up one thing. I'm not worthy to even be his slave because he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. I love this message so much. Are you learning anything about Jesus? The fire represents Jesus as well. Not just the love, but the fire represents Jesus as well. His purifying fire. A lot of people uh, say, well, G- what did Jesus say? Jesus said in Luke 12, 49, I have come to set the world on fire and I wish it were already burning. God wants to set Oasis Church and the city of Los Angeles and the nations on fire for God. If there are any laws being passed that you feel are against God's word, it's because the nation is not on fire. And the church's fire has gone to a smoldering, flickering flame. And so then now, if we're not careful, we need legislation to replace inflammation. Did you see how I did that thing? We need to be flammable. Are you flammable? 
if a fire gets too close to something, that something burns. If we stay on fire and we get close to people who are not on fire, we can catch them on fire. That is the spreading of gospel, the nation on fire in the first place. He wants to light on fire as the church. Now, I understand everybody disagrees and everybody's arguing over, over law, but I'm telling you, God wants to set, Jesus said, I came to set the world on fire. For God so loved the world that he came to set it on fire. See, we can't look at John 3, 16 and not look at Luke 29. For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son to set the world on fire. Not just to walk around and people could just live how they want, do what they want, be who they want. No, no, no. I so love the world that I want to set it on fire. Do you so love your neighbor that you want to see them on fire for God? Or is your faith your faith and their faith is their faith? No, he so loved the world. He wanted to see the world on fire. This is profoundly revelatory when it comes to who Jesus is. He is not just the person who said, I love you, I love you, I love you. I love you, therefore, I want to see you on fire. Has your fire gone dim in this season? I know mine has. And I was looking for different things to make me feel the fire. I was trying to cozy. Some of y'all coming to church is cozying up to someone else's fire. Can you walk in someone else's house and cozy up to their fireplace? No. That this is weird. You're supposed to have your own fire. And then together, we are supposed to be as a church, a blazing inferno that lights this community on fire. This is so important for us to understand this. And this is why I believe God was trying to give us prophetic revelation by saying the fire at the brazen altar can never go out. Can you write this down as well? It takes multi-generations to keep the fire of God going. Genesis 22. Anybody feel like they're getting old? I feel like I'm getting old. I feel like I'm getting old. Um, one of our staff members' kids came and hugged me the other day. And I remember getting those hugs, and those hugs used to be on the leg. Now it was in the chest, like just, I'm oh like, God, I'm getting old. And the older I get, I'm 45, the older I get, so I've been saying this recently, I'm closer to the tomb than the womb. <laughs> I feel like, don't say that. It's, I feel like I'm closer. I feel like I'm closer. I've been thinking about what do I want my legacy to be? What do I want to spend the rest of my life doing? Do I want to spend the rest of my life just doing these certain things? No, it takes multi-generations to keep the fire of God going. Look at this in Genesis chapter 22, verse 6, when Abraham was going up the mountain of sacrifice. It says, so Abraham placed the wood for the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulders. I want to go back to Leviticus 6. This is wildly important, wildly important. Each morning, the priest will add fresh wood to the fire. That's what it says in Leviticus 6, verse 12. Each morning, the priest will add fresh wood to the fire. Notice in, in Genesis chapter 22, that it is Isaac who is carrying the wood, while Abraham, the older generation, carried the fire and the knife. Abraham kept, carried the fire and the, and the instrument for sacrifice, and Isaac carried the thing to make the fire even get hotter. A multi-generational church is when people getting older, whatever your age is, don't lose their fire, and young people carry the wood to make the fire even hotter. It is young people in our church that make the fire even hotter. That's why we do young adults. That's why we do youth. That's why we do students. That's why we have kids ministry, because those kids, those young people are going to put wood on the fire that the older generations brings into the room. So we don't necessarily want uh, young people to be responsible for the fire will carry the fire, but they got to carry the wood to make the fire that we have even hotter. And that's why we got to stop looking down on young people for the way that they dress and their sins. No, no, let them carry the wood. We'll carry the fire. Let them have their season to just carry the wood. And as long as they can put wood on our fire and encourage us, then yeah, let them get some of those things. Let, we're not trying to make a rule or a law so that young people, I, man, I feel like preaching. Let, where's my Bible? I'm about to just, I'm going to grab my phone. Am I still in shock? Yeah. I'm about to grab my phone. Y'all got me in here. Y'all trying to make all these rules and regulations for the young people thinking you're doing something for God. We need laws that these children obey. When God gave these laws, Deuteronomy 11 Verse one, it says, love the Lord your God and keep his requirements. 
his decrees, his laws, and his command always. Someone say always. Always. I'm talking to the older generation. Verse 2 says, remember today, now that I'm not talking to your children. Wait, what? Hold on, hold on. Let me, let me, hold on, Pastor Julian. You, 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 we, we, need to, we need to make sure we have laws that these young people that don't know the Lord have to obey. Because I'm obeying the law, and we want godly laws, right? Yeah, we do. For adults, for mature Christians. Y'all should know better. You know the law. But he literally says... And I'm so glad I'm reading from scripture because somebody said, I, I don't understand. There's, there's no way this is biblical. We must have godly leaders and biblical values in the church. There's no way this is accurate. I'm, that's why I'm reading from Deuteronomy 11, not my own opinion. And I snuck that voice in. I'm going to read it again. You must love the Lord your God and always obey his requirements, decrees, regulations, and commands. So it doesn't mean the law. We need laws. But he says in verse 2, keep in mind that I am not talking now to your children. I will, but not now. I'm not talking to your children now. Why? Who have never experienced the discipline of the Lord your God or seen his greatness and his strong hand and powerful arm. Verse three, they did not see the miraculous signs and wonders he performed in Egypt against Pharaoh and all his land. They did not see the Lord, what the Lord did to the armies of Egypt and to their horses and how he drowned them in the Red Sea as they were chasing you. He destroyed them and they have not recovered to this very day. Verse five, your children didn't see how the Lord cared for you in the wilderness where the tabernacle was until you arrived here. They didn't see what he did to Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, the descendant of Reuben, when the earth opened its mouth in the Israelite camp in front of the tabernacle and swallowed them along with their households and tents and every living thing that belonged to them. But you have seen the Lord perform all these mighty deeds with your very own eyes. Therefore, be careful to obey every command I am giving you today so that you may have the strength to go in and take over the land you are about to enter. This sermon is incredible. It's incredible. Can I say that? Does that sound arrogant and prideful? Okay, let me just... This scripture is incredible. When do the laws of God kick in? The laws of God kicked in when the land of God was getting ready to kick in. The promised laws help you reach the promised land. So kids who don't even know what they want to do, we're not supposed to be putting laws on them. We are supposed to be carrying the fire. We are supposed to be the one being obedient. They're supposed to watch us be obedient. And when they see God, you know you've seen God move in your finances. So obey the scriptures on generosity. You know you've seen God uh, uh, move in healing. So obey the scriptures on healing. You know you've seen God encouraging her faith. So, So walk in faith like the scripture says. But he says, don't put that stuff on a generation that hasn't seen God move. If we're going to have the fire of God going, we need a generation who's seen God move, carrying the fire for a generation who hasn't seen God move. Read Deuteronomy 11. Keep in mind, I'm not talking to your children. I'm talking to you. So the reason why we have people fighting for young people to obey the laws of God is because we don't have fathers and mothers as Christians anymore. And, and, and I, I feel like flowing. I feel like, pre- and by the way, between the book of Malachi and the book of Matthew was 400 years of silence. No one could find anything that God said to anyone since he said something to Malachi. And the first thing he said in, in Matthew, he said something to a man by the name of Zechariah. This ain't in my notes. I just feel like preaching. The last thing he said to Malachi was the hearts of the father would return to the hearts of the children. And then he didn't say anything else for 400 years. 400 years later, read it. In Matthew, he would talk to a man named Zechariah and tell Zechariah he's going to have a son by the name of John the Baptist. Why are you going to have a son? Because the hearts of the father are getting ready to return to the hearts of the children. And Zechariah went, when is the last time I heard that? 400 years ago. And God repeated himself. 400 years. 
God repeated himself. So what happens before the law is the hearts of the fathers and the mothers need to return to the hearts of the children, the younger generation, and the the hearts of the children need to return to the older generation. And now the older generation carries the fire and they don't put that fire on the young generation. They say, you give me the wood, I'll keep the fire. And when you grow in maturity and you see God move, now we gotta talk about some regulations because the regulations were not meant to make God happy. They were meant to take you to the next level. Does anybody wanna go to the next level? Don't pray for the promised land and not want the rules. God never gave them anything in Egypt to do. Egypt would represent where America is right now and not one law was given to them. He brought them out of Egypt into the wilderness which represents the presence and the tabernacle of God. And then here come the rules. So it's only when he removed them and they knew that God had done something with them that he started to give them expectations. Why do we have biblical expectations for people who have not seen the living biblical God? Because we've lost our fire. That's why. We've lost it. And so we want to shortcut holiness through legislation when at the end of the day came through fire. I was the most sinful person ever. There's no one in this room who's committed more sin than me. And thank God I didn't come to, to certain churches right now. Thank God I came to a church and met a man on fire. Because had I not met a man on fire, I would not be who I was today. You, I did not become this from coming to church and going to connect groups. We gotta do all those things. I came to church because in the connect group, I met a man on fire. I feel like throwing this binder. So I hope that people meet me in between now and when I get to meet Jesus in person and they meet a man on fire because I've lost my fire for a while. I lost it. And then I start looking for God to do different things to get my fire back different blessings. Oh, maybe we could get this, or maybe we get a bigger house, or maybe if I had this job, or maybe I had this role, or maybe if we did this, we had this money, then I could get my fire back. No, God says you're going to get it through the fire. Always keep it burning was the rule for the brazen altar. Jesus. Genesis 22, 7, Isaac said to his dad, father, Yes, my son, we have the fire in the wood, the boy said. But, but where is the sheep for the burnt offering? God provided the sacrifice. We're, I'm never going to make interns, volunteers, staff people provide the sacrifice. They have to provide the wood. They have to provide the fire. Here's something else I want you to understand about a fire that's never to go out, and I got to move faster. A fire for the word of God will give you a fire for the plans of God. Without a fire for the word of God, you won't have a fire for the plans of God. Jeremiah 20 verse 9 says this, or excuse me, 23 verse 29 says, does not my word burn like a fire, says the Lord? Is it not like a mighty hammer that smashes a rock to pieces? We are going to close with this one thought because I believe God is going to, you're going to hear from God about some things he's asking you to do some spaces he's asking you to move into. Because again, these rules and these regulations and the wilderness and the brazen altar were preparing people for the promises of God, the promised land. And this is what I feel like certain people are not doing um, with fire. And I'm gonna close with this. I want you to write this down. Um, You need a fire for your plan B. You need to burn up your plan B. Once God speaks to you and tells you that you're going to be a pastor of a church in Los Angeles, burn up your plan B. There's almost like this thing in COVID when COVID messed up the church so much and, you know, people give less and show up less. I went, I wonder what else God would have. I start coming up with plan Bs. Like, what, what else does God want to do besides pastoring a church? Start feeling unfulfilled because it wasn't what it was. And God's like, I'm going to give that to you. And then I'm going to make you burn it up. You got to burn up your plan B. Here's what's crazy. A fire for your plan B. Somebody, and not your plan B because you want to do something and it's not God. I'm not talking about that. Get some people with wisdom in your life. I'm talking about when you know that you know that you know 
Stop relying on that thing. Some of you know that you're waiting for your husband and you got a plan B person who keeps texting you if God doesn't send your husband in this season. I'm talking about burn it up. 1 Kings 19, verse 19 through 21 says, Elijah went and found Elijah, son of Shep. Shephat? It's in the Bible. <laughs> Shephat? It's in the Bible. God did that for me. Everybody put it in the chat. Shephat? So Elijah went and found Elijah, son of Shephat, plowing a field. There were 12 teams of oxen in the field. And Elijah was plowing with the 12th team, which is the most unqualified team, the team that the the, the first 11 went first. So uh, if you went last, you were inexperienced. Elijah went over to him and threw his cloak over his shoulders. He, He gave the promise to the person who was unqualified. And then he walked away. Elijah left the ox standing there, ran after Elijah and said to him, first, let me go and kiss my father and mother goodbye because he knew it just went down. It went all the way down. And then I will go with you. And Elijah replied, go back, go on back, but think about what I've done to you. Think about the moment we just had. Think about that moment you had with God where he told you what you would would do. And the Bible says when Elijah thought about that moment, he returned to his oxen and slaughtered them. And he used the wood from the plow to build a fire to roast their flesh. And he passed around the meat to all the townspeople and they all ate. And then he went with Elijah as his assistant. He didn't go into what God called him to until he burned up the thing he would be tempted to go back to if it didn't work out. This is good stuff, brother Sam. This might be in my top three. Lord, is that okay to say? Holy Spirit said it's in your top three. Holy Spirit said it's in my... You, do you... The fire of God burned up his plan B. Do you need the fire to burn up your plan B today? Are you having trouble in your marriage and deep down you've been thinking about a plan B? Do you need the fire of God to burn up your plan B? Are you having trouble in your calling and you need the fire of God to burn up your plan B? Are you having trouble figuring out how God is going to do that thing he told you to do and and there's a temptation to go back to a plan B? You need the fire of God to burn up your plan B. Leviticus 6 verse 13 at the brazen altar it said remember the fire must be kept burning on the altar at all times I want to leave you with this thought if we're going to talk about the sacrifices that need to be put on the altar last week then you have to understand the altar is rendered useless if there is no fire so as we make these sacrifices for God they feel like obligations without fire We need the fire of his presence, the fire of his glory, which represents his goodness, the fire of his purity, which represents the removal of sins. And we have to understand that Christ is coming back, not as a baby, but as a blazing, burning fire. And if we can get that in our heart, then yeah, you won't get there overnight, but it'll start to adjust how casual we are about allowing ourselves to do things that are different than what his word says and what his Holy Spirit would lead us to do. Father, I thank you so much for the fire of God that is sweeping across this online service, sweeping across our nation. And God, we will wait on the Lord. We are waiting for the fire of God, the fire that no politician can bring, the fire that no pastor can bring, the fire that no spiritual leader can bring. It is a fire that only you can bring. Jesus, you said yourself, you came to light the world on fire and how you wish it were already burning. God, we say the same thing you say, how we wish the world were on fire and that was already burning. And God, we cannot do that that if we are not on fire. So give it to us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Man, I love y'all. I'm back. I'm back. I didn't know I was gone, but I'm back. I'm back like I never left. I'm back for the first time. I'm back. I'm black and I'm back. Let's keep going until we get a like, okay, for me. Like Brianna's like, oh, all right, all right, all right. And my wife was here. You filled in for her, Brianna, in that moment because if Christina was here, she was like, all right, all right, let's, let's end it. So love you guys so much. Can't wait to see you soon. Hey, do me a huge favor. Fill out an online connect card right now, oasisla.org forward slash connect. It, I, I'm, I, do, I beseech you. I beg you. I'm believing for 30 connect cards to be filled out right now oasisla.org forward slash online connect if you care about me 
at all, go do it right now. Um, I'm using guilt because I really want you to go do it. If, you, if, you, if I'm your pastor, go do it. If you think you might be interested in going to heaven, oasisla.org forward slash online connect. Love you so much and I'll see you soon.